So welcome to uh, Winter Birds Live. My name is Nathan Manti. We're so glad you could join us. Thanks for sticking around. We apologize for the technical difficulties. And uh, so today we are uh, broadcasting live from Camp Heidelberg Outdoor and Environmental Education Center. Uh, we are on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. And our region is located on the Haldeman Tract, for which rent is owing. Since we're here today to learn about the birds and learn from the birds, we want to thank the birds uh, for being present with us today and give them our gratitude and respect for everything they can teach us. So without further ado, I want to say again welcome and I'm going to invite some members of the outdoor and environmental education team to, uh, to introduce themselves. But first I'm going to introduce Dave Pope, our cameraman. He's behind the camera there. Um, thanks very much Dave for all that you do. And uh, now we're going to turn over to Al Woodhouse. Hi everyone, my name is Al Woodhouse. Uh, we're at Camp Heidelberg Environmental Education Center where typically I'd be stationed with classes. Uh, really, really glad to be here today. It's a beautiful day. We've really lucked out uh, with the days that we've had for our live events, including this one. The birds behind me, they are black capped chickadees. They're cooperating really well. And we're here as part of the winter bird count, which is going to be happening uh, just about 10 days or so, or actually shorter 10 days. Uh, where it gives students the opportunity to go outside, maybe watch from your window if you feel like it, and count any birds in the neighborhood as part of uh, coupling and pairing it with their Christmas bird count activity. Fantastic, Al. So while our other uh, outdoor educators are just solving a couple technical issues, I wanted to, to ask you, Al, uh, this is a citizen science event. Can you talk to me a little bit about uh, what is citizen science and what's the value of citizen science? Uh, sure. Citizen science is all about regular people like us contributing to scientific information. Uh, in, in terms of birds, there are only so many bird scientists, paid bird scientists uh, in Ontario, not that many. But when you think about all the different, uh, all the numbers of people that are interested in bird watching as a hobby, even have a bird theater outside their window, that, that's probably numbering in the tens of thousands. So if all of these people are writing down or taking notes or counting birds, you can imagine how all of that information, that's a tremendous amount of scientific information that you know, those tens of thousands of people are able to collect in comparison to, say, the very few scientists that are being paid for bird research. So citizen science is a very, very important part of contributing knowledge to the scientific community. And, you know, as part of the winter bird count, that's what this is all about. It's about a citizen science initiative, us contributing to the amount of knowledge that scientists can work with. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Al. So we are going to get to student questions. I have a whole page of questions submitted by students. and. Feel free to post your questions into the chat. Our moderator will be uh, choosing questions from the chat to ask live. But next, I'm going to ask Sean to introduce himself. Uh, this is Sean McCammon. Tell us about yourself. Well, I work at the uh, Laurel Creek Nature Center in Waterloo. And you know, that's where I normally work. These days, I'm working from home. And uh, the bird count is coming up here. And one of the questions we had, I know, is how are we going to be able to find birds? Where should we be looking to find birds? And um, I know a lot of people, if they think, okay, I need to go out and find some birds to count them, the first thought would be, I need to go into a forest somewhere because birds live in forests. Uh, but the truth of that is really birds live in every different type of habitat around us. And so you would find birds in forests, you find birds in fields, wetlands, even in the middle of cities, really. And so when I'm choosing, uh, a hike where I want to find as many birds as possible. I'm thinking about a route that will take me kind of by a whole bunch of different habitats. And so if I can find a park somewhere where there's maybe a pond or a lake that has some forest, you're going to see a wider variety of birds uh, if you can go by a few different habitats. And so uh, edges where kind of a, a forest meets a field is a good place to look for birds. Uh, I know when I was driving here, I saw wild turkeys uh, along the road. And wild turkeys like to go out into a kind of a farm field and look for grain out in the farm field, but they need to be able to, to hide if their predator comes by. And so they like to be beside a forest as well. And so if you can find a habitat or a, kind of a trail where two habitats meet, that's always a good place to find birds. Fantastic, thanks, Sean. Now on that note, uh, we had a couple students wanting to know how they could attract uh, birds to their yard. Um, so we could go out into different habitats to look for birds, but what if we want to do some bird watching from our window? Well, if you have access to some bird seed, you know, especially in the winter time when it's harder for birds to find food, if you can offer them a few different types of seeds, 
you will attract birds outside your window. Um, and different birds like to eat different foods. I know in the in some of the questions that were sent in beforehand, a lot of them were concerned with what should I feed birds? And different birds eat different things. So something like a blue jay, blue jay really likes sunflower seeds. They really love peanuts. Um, something like a finch would might go for niger seed, which is a smaller, finer seed. Um, and different types of feeders help as well. So some birds can go to a hanging feeder like we have here, but some birds like morning doves are gonna be eat feeding off the ground. And so if you have a platform feeder, that helps too. Uh, if you don't have bird seed, you know, I know in my neighborhood, there's a lot of my neighbors have uh, bird feeders out and just walking around my neighborhood, I can find different bird feeders. If you go into an area, and this is, I think I made a little video of this somewhere. Uh, if you go to into an area where you kind of expect to find birds, like where there's some thick bushes or cedar trees, uh, and you don't see the birds, there's a trick that some birders like to use uh, where they make this noise. And, you know, scientists, biologists, ornithologists, they're not really sure why this happens, but some birds are attracted to that sound. And some people have speculated, maybe that sound kind of sounds like the alarm call of some birds. And so they're coming out to see if um, there's a predator around. Uh, some people have said that sound kind of sounds like uh, a noise insects would make that they would want to eat. And so they think there's a potential food source out there and they come to investigate. Some people have said, you know, maybe they're just curious. Maybe they're playful and they just want to see what's making that weird noise in their habitat. And so if you're out someplace and you don't see the birds, you don't hear the birds, but you think you're in a pretty good bird spot, if you try making this noise, now that's a little trick that sometimes you can get the birds to pop up and uh, check out where that noise is coming from. Good question. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sean. So now we're going to go over to Levi. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, Levi. And the winter bird count is coming up December 16th through 23rd. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about what we're asking students to do during the winter bird count. Hey everybody, my name is Levi. Uh, I run the Rigby Corners Nature Centre. And uh, uh, just to give you a brief overview of what we're doing with the winter Christmas bird count, or sorry, our winter bird count, uh, we've loosely modeled it after uh, an annual event, a citizen science event, uh, called the Christmas Bird Count. Um, now, our event, instead of being one day like the Christmas Bird Count is, ours is going to be over several days. It's going to start on uh, uh, December 16th and it's going to continue until December 23rd. And what we'd like you to do uh, is head outside. You can do this in your backyard. You can do it from your porch. Uh, you can do it from a forest near your house or if there's a, a field uh, at, and a local park. Uh, we'd encourage you to go out uh, and try and see some birds. You can use your eyes. If you have a pair of binoculars, bring those. Uh, we've made some fabulous resources. Thank you to uh, our resident uh, photo expert, Al Woodhouse. Uh, we've put together a checklist of birds for you to look for. Uh, take that with you or bring your phone so you can compare some of the birds you see to our checklist uh, and record presence, absence, if, you, if you're not sure, but if you can actually count how many chickadees, how many nuthatches, how many cardinals, how many blue jays you see, record that when you're outside, uh, bring the information home with you, uh, get it back onto our website, uh, go to the Google form we've created and submit your observations. Uh, you don't have to be an expert to do this. Uh, you can be uh, anybody. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, I'm giving, being given the cue that I should talk louder. Um, you don't have to be an expert. Uh, in fact, this was designed for students, uh, teachers, uh, administrators, people like myself. We want everybody to go out, count as many birds as you can. Uh, you, you should go out for at least 15 minutes, uh, but you can go out all day if you want. Uh, make sure you record the day you go, how long you go, uh, and where you go, and share that information with us as well. So this is our, uh, the first of what we hope will be many winter Christmas bird counts. Fantastic, thanks very much. Now, uh, Levi, you mentioned the annual event of the Christmas bird count. Uh, and I'm wondering if I can ask any of the outdoor educators here to tell us a little bit about the history of that. Um, I know I was watching The Crown recently and I saw a scene, it looked like Christmas and they were shooting a bunch of birds. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so the original Christmas bird count was uh, the Christmas hunt. 
and this was a, a popular time about 120 years ago and uh, people would go out with their guns uh, looking for birds and to prove that they'd found them they would shoot them and collect them. Uh, some early ornithologists, those are people who study birds, uh, decided that they didn't need to actually kill the birds to count them and that we could we could use the honor system and simply keep a list uh, and record what we saw uh, and then compare that instead of uh, bringing the actual birds back with us. Uh, many people prefer to do this with a camera and we, we hunt them with our phones now uh, and we get photographic evidence. But you don't need to do that for our winter bird count. Uh, we will trust you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Levi. So uh, we're going to go to some student questions now. I have a, a couple of questions from Ms. Turnbill's class. Uh, and these questions are for any of you. When did you start bird watching? And have you ever left Canada to go bird watching? <laughs> All right. Um, I, I was lucky enough growing up in Ottawa that I grew up uh, beside a forest and beside the Rideau River. And uh, I spent a lot of my childhood out in the woods. I will say I wasn't big on identifying the birds. I'd come back and I'd tell my mom, you know, I saw an owl today. And I really wouldn't worry about, you know, figuring out what type of owl that was. I just saw an owl. Um, as I've gotten into this job and having to teach students about birds, certainly my knowledge of birds, my experience with birds has widened. Uh, as far as going out of the country, a few years ago, I went to Costa Rica. And I'm going to say that part of the excitement of Costa Rica, it's a beautiful country, uh, but part of the excitement for me was looking for birds. And I kept a list and I'm going to say in like the first day I was there, I had seen 75 birds that I'd never seen before. Um, some of the birds that were there were birds that were wintering from Canada. And so um, when I was done, I saw over 125 different species of birds really that I'd never seen before. I remember walking beside a banana plantation and seeing this amazing bird come over and just thinking, I can't believe this thing exists. What, what is that? And I, it turned out I had a book of, you know, Costa Rican birds and it was called uh, Montezuma oropendola or oropendola. Um, yeah, just an amazing bird and, you know, just if you're excited about birds, if you're into birds, you know, birds are in every country of the world, every habitat. And so anytime I go on a trip now, I know it drives my family a little bit crazy, but I'm keeping a list of birds and saying, stopping the cars, we're driving around saying, what was that? So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Let's, uh, let's ask the same question. When did you start bird watching? Yeah, uh, I started bird watching probably when I was in my early teens. Uh, I'd always been sort of interested in nature and spent a lot of time wandering around outside, building forts and just exploring. Um, and then a family friend actually introduced me to bird watching. And you know, it was fun to use binoculars and it was, uh, it was just a another excuse to get outside. But it was actually in high school when uh, I met actually the, the former uh, person who ran Wrigley Corners, Mr. Ted Chesky. He introduced me to bird banding and uh, the, the moment I had a, a little black cap chickadee in my hand, I was, I was hooked on birding and it's become a lifelong passion ever since. And uh, I've traveled across Canada birding. I've only been outside of Canada looking for birds once uh, and I was in university. Actually, uh, Larry Lamb from the, the Ecology Lab at the University of Waterloo led a, a bunch of friends and I on a trip down to the United States and into Mexico and saw tons of birds that blew my mind and further cemented my love of nature and, and, and ornithology. Levi, you mentioned bird banding. Now, uh, I've gone for walks with my kids and seen geese and other birds that have like a little bracelet on their leg. Can you tell our listeners and viewers a little bit more about what is bird banding? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Nathan. So, uh, bird banding is uh, this activity that uh, ornithologists engage in where you set up a mist net or ground trap or we, we have other fancy traps that we can use sometimes like rocket nets and we'll capture birds. Uh, you have to be trained to do this so if you are a licensed bird bander uh, you can handle these birds and then you have a, some special equipment, a special pair of pliers and you get some metal bands from the government that have a barcode on them essentially. It's a, it's a long number. Uh, Using those special pliers, you can attach that band to the bird's leg. Uh, once it's on, it's on for life. The, the bands are made so the birds cannot remove them. 
They're very, very light though. They, they weigh less than a, like a fraction of a gram. So just like a bracelet or a watch, once you have it on, once the bird has this band on, they don't feel it after a while. It, they become acclimatized to it. Uh, and then after we take a few measurements, we measure wing length and bill length sometimes, we weigh them and we look for fat, things like that. We release them. And people like myself and Al Woodhouse are licensed bird banders and we will do this here uh, at Camp Heidelberg. And then we release these birds. There are bird banders in other parts of Canada and certainly throughout North America and into South America. And we hope, this is the, perhaps the most important part, that we hope that people like myself, a bird banders in other countries, will recapture those birds. And if they read the number that's etched into that metal band, we can track them. And all of the data, all these observations from licensed bird banders across North America and South America all get shared in one common database. So if we were to band uh, a bird here, like a, I don't know, what would be a good example of a bird we might band here? Robin? Robin? Oh yeah, American Robin. We banded an American Robin here at Camp Heidelberg and then let it go. Uh, someone maybe down in Florida might recapture that bird, enter that data into the, the, the database, and then we'd be able to track the migration of that bird. So this has become a common science tool that we use to answer all kinds of important questions about birds. Uh, the most important perhaps being uh, migration, but we've also learned a lot about bird populations and behavior through bird banding. Thank you very much, Levi. So we're going to ask the same question of Al, and I, and I want to ask you, aside from when did you start bird watching, Al um, Elliott at King Edward Public School wants to know how many bird species are in Waterloo Region? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, Levi, you might have to help me out. I haven't I've never counted, but uh, I will say, how did I get into birding? First, I was 24, so I was pretty late, and it was also Ted Chesky, the same individual that introduced Levi or uh, instilled the passion into Levi for bird watching. Um, it, it was actually a bird that I didn't even get a chance to see that started my bird watching career, which is maybe an interesting story, but maybe we'll save that for another day. Uh, we'll see. But um, I, I, like Levi, had always loved nature, but yeah, birds were never really a part of my interest at that point. And then I got hooked and I've never looked back. It's absolutely incredible to watch the behaviors and the variety or diversity of species that we have. I know on this property, uh, at this outdoor education center, I've seen 167 different types of birds over the last 20 years. We have about 300 different birds that uh, nest in Canada. How many in Waterloo, Levi? 300 bird species have been observed so, in sorry, Waterloo. Yeah, sorry, in Ontario, yeah, 300 yeah. have been observed in, in Waterloo. Yeah, but, but those not are, nesting. So that includes a bunch of those, like ones that get blown in with a hurricane. Yep, so they include the rarities that come up from the south or the ones that nest up north that uh, we have some pine siskins in the trees earlier on. Uh, they sometimes nest in Waterloo region, sometimes not, but that includes them. Uh, common red poles are flying around right now. They don't nest in Waterloo region, but certainly they're on my list. Uh, and then you have birds like the chickadee, uh, which certainly is on the list of birds that's very commonly found in Waterloo region. Amazing. Thank you to the chickadee who, who flew into the shot there. Uh, so. Uh, we're gonna go now to the chat. So I know lots of you have been typing into the chat. That's fantastic. We love that engagement. I'm gonna introduce Joe Bell. Joe, uh, I'm wondering, have you had any great questions from the chat that you wanna ask our bird experts? Well, uh, Nathan, thank you. We have some fantastic questions that are coming in today. And I, I have a question coming in from uh, somebody on the chat, the coder, and they wanna know how many different types of birds change their color in the winter? We'll start with some examples. Are there any birds that you can think of that change color in winter? I can think of lots of mammals. Well, if you think of like a goldfinch, um, the males in the summertime are bright, bright yellow, and in the wintertime they, they molt and get a, they get a duller yellowish, maybe that's probably where they get their name, the goldfinch, because they don't, I would call them a yellow finch, I would think, in the summer, but in the wintertime they've got a duller color to them. Um, what else is out there, boys? Yeah, uh, lots of waterfowl. Uh, we'll have what they call their lunar plumage. And uh, so uh, there's the, the bright colors that you will see on many uh, different types of ducks and waterfowl, uh, and that will change through the year. And then when it's time to breed, the, the males in particular will get those nice bright colors back. So waterfowl definitely change their plumage through the year. Shorebirds. 
Uh, lots of shorebirds um, that like sandpipers and phalaropes. Uh, they certainly do. Our provincial bird, which is the common loon, it has that you know nice dark sheen of that green and black on its head with the necklace. But in the winter time, it just sort of has a, a little darker gray wash and and uh, not not very vibrant at all. So there are lots of different types of birds that do change their color. Some we see around Waterloo uh, commonly. Uh, some perhaps not, but. As Levi said, waterfowl are famous for it, shorebirds are famous for it, even our provincial warblers. bird. Warblers, oh my goodness, warblers, yeah, good one. Yeah. Warblers change, in fact, there, there's a couple of pages in bird guides called Confusing Fall Warblers because they lose what we would say are the, the gems of the forest. Uh, they lose their bright colors and they go to a, a little more drab, uh, so muted colors uh, during the wintertime. So winter plumage, lots of birds, not all, but lots of birds do change from their bright uh, breeding colors or breeding, plu uh, sorry, breeding plumage to more of an eclipsed or uh, wintertime plumage. Fantastic. Thank That's you very question. much, Al. Yeah. That's like 200. Maybe. We've got a question from uh, Sammy, who is a distance learner from Laurelwood. Two questions. Sammy wants to know, how do birds affect us? And also, do birds eat spiders? <laughs> awesome. Good question. Uh, yes, many birds eat spiders, especially some of the ones that Al just mentioned, like the warblers, the chickadees, the finches. All of those birds are insectivorous. They also will eat fruit uh, and uh, nuts but uh, and different types of seeds. But the vast majority of the smaller perching birds uh, will eat insects at some stage in their life cycle. Uh, perhaps they are the most voracious for things like spiders uh, early in the spring when uh, they're raising young. The, the baby birds, as they're growing, eat a lot of protein. Uh, your, your parents might be on you about making sure you eat the protein, because that's, that's the stuff that helps you build muscle and helps you grow. So yes, they definitely eat lots and lots of spiders. Uh, what was the other part of the question? The other question is, how do birds affect us? Oh yeah. Um, the, the number of ways that birds affect us is perhaps too long to get into for this one hour uh, live event but maybe the most important way that they affect us is through uh, bringing that, that happiness factor. Um, I spend a lot of time outside birding, not just because I'm, I'm interested in monitoring populations or not because I want to know uh, some specialized bird behavior. Uh, I'm out there with my binoculars watching birds uh, because it makes me happy. So that might be the most important way that they affect me. Uh, Sean, do you have a, a way? Well, there's lots of ways the birds affect us. I mean. It's just good as part of your day to notice other living things, to be aware of the natural world and just, you know, everything around us is just trying to get by as best they can in the same way that we're trying to. And just to be able to stop and, you know, acknowledge that during your day is good. And I was, just, I was also going to mention something that popped up with that spider question. I, I read a study where uh, wrens in one, in the study, one wren in one day brought 500 spiders back to a nest in one day. So, that's a good birds one. do eat spiders. Amazing. <laughs> Here's another question from Ms. Turnbill's class. Uh, what is the number one cause of death among birds? And a follow-up, what would happen if you took away all the trees? Where would the birds live? Start at the other end and work your way down this way, sure. <laughs> sure why not? Uh, the number one cause of bird death it's going to be habitat loss by by humans destroying or even changing their habitat to the point where they struggle to survive there. Habitat loss and habitat destruction is the main reason why birds are disappearing in pretty well every area of the planet right now. Uh, I'm going to leave number two for Levi, if that's all right, Levi. Yeah. Um, but habitat loss is definitely the big one. And I'm, oh, look at how happy I am now. <laughs> I, I'm the same way, Levi. Birds bring me great joy, whether it's seeing them or you know having them land on me and just hearing them. Hearing that there is extra life out there that I might not be able to see, but I can certainly hear the activity. So um, uh, we, we want to protect the habitats to protect our bird populations, that's for sure. All right, so um, Al's, com Al's comment about how habitat loss is the number one uh, cause of mortality for birds is most definitely correct. Uh, we would call that an indirect cause of mortality. Uh, I don't think people go out cutting forests down with the purpose of, of killing birds. Uh, so it's an indirect consequence. I would say the the number one direct cause of mortality that's attributed to, to humans would be cats. 
and I'm, I'm not going to be very popular for saying this, but cats are considered an invasive species in many ways. We brought them to North America and when we let them out of our house, uh, they are carnivores and their instinct is to hunt. And the vast majority of their prey are rodents. However, cats are amazing acrobats and they can, they can get up into those trees and they can catch lots and lots of birds. So uh, I think it's estimated that 2.6 billion birds in North America die every year uh, in the teeth of cats. So I would say that's probably the number two cause of mortality for birds. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the cats are a big one. I read that like 100 million birds in Canada alone are killed by cats. Uh, there's, there's some other big ones here. I know like window strikes, birds running into windows kills 100 million to a billion. I've heard vastly different estimates with that. Pesticides are a big problem. I think probably 100 million birds a year are killed by pesticides. And that may be underreported too because the bird eats some pesticide, they get sick, and then some hawk comes and grabs them because their uh, brain isn't working right. And so, you know, car strikes are a big one. Humans are a huge, have a huge impact on birds indirectly through habitat destruction. Half of the world's forests are gone. Over half of the world's wetlands are gone. Um, two thirds of the world's bird species live in tropical rainforest. And over 60% of tropical rainforest is gone too. So, you know, it, it's not a good story for birds when it comes to humans, but you know, there are some good stories out there. Bald eagle populations are on the rise in North America. So, you know, if we get a handle on and we have better science around birds, we can figure out how to protect them better. Fantastic. Let's go to the chat with Joe. Well, hello, uh, uh, all students out there in the Waterloo Region District School Board. Fantastic questions are coming into the chat. We're only going to be able to get to a handful of them, but our, our, our experts that are in the field today will be answering all of the questions as soon as they can after today's broadcast. But from Sam M, we have a fantastic question, and I'm just going to have to read it here. What are the long-term effects of giving wild birds food, shelter, water, and affection? Let's go to the panel. Well, um, you know, our habitat, human habitat, has replaced bird habitat. So, you know, where our houses and apartments and cities and roads are, that used to be pretty good bird habitat. And uh, if we can replace some of those things that the birds are missing, like offering food during the winter time, uh, a big one for birds in human habitats is shelter and nesting sites. That if we have a dead tree in the city that has a hole in it, we cut it down. We see that as a danger, it's gonna fall on somebody or somebody's house or a car. So we cut them all down. And so a lot of times what the birds are missing is um, a nest site. And so putting up uh, bird boxes that are designed for different types of birds, that can be very helpful as well. Um, you know, feeding the birds is good. Putting up water for the birds is good. Even in the winter time, sometimes in the winter, the thing that's hardest to find for birds is, is water that isn't frozen. And so they can eat snow, but if you can give them, you know, a bird bath, a heated bird bath, or even just put out water in a, in a, in a garbage can lid someplace, they'll, they'll come to that even in the winter time. Yeah. Um, keeping a well-stocked bird feeder is important. I think it definitely helped many of our local birds, of our chickadees. You'll find many chickadees coming to your bird feeder. Um, I, I would say it's important to make sure that you're giving them the right kind of food and keeping the, the food, uh, sorry, the, keeping your bird feeders clean. That's a piece that many people don't do. So if, if you're, if you're going to be putting up bird feeders, you've got to make sure that you maintain them. Uh, another thing that you can do that really complements uh, feed, hand feeding, or sorry, really complements having bird feeders is to uh, plant in your yard a, a bird garden is what we call it. And if you put a mix of uh, some shrubs that gives the birds a little bit of shelter. If you can put those close enough to your bird feeders that the birds have a, a place to perch and take uh, shelter on a windy day, that's, that really helps birds out. Um, I think it's also important to plant native species that have a variety of different things on them. So if you can plant a, a, something in your yard that offers some fruit and another, some other plant that offers some seeds, 
uh, that would all be beneficial for birds. Amazing, thank you very much. And uh, you mentioned bird habitat, and behind us here we have these amazing cedar trees, uh, and those uh, eastern white cedars provide an awful lot of, uh, of shelter for these chickadees. Now, uh, the next thing we wanna go to here is a little wing quiz. Um, Al, can you tell us a little bit about how these birds died? Uh, I can tell you some, unfortunately. Uh, Levi has a couple of wings from birds in his hand. He's got one that has some yellow on it. Uh, Levi, did you say that one hit a window at Wrigley Corners, unfortunately? So there's an example of a window strike. None of these birds have been, uh, none of these birds have been killed for uh, the purpose of us showing you. These are all accidental death. And I don't know if anyone has a guess at what type of bird, I almost gave it away there, what type of bird this wing came from. Uh, but if you're using our bird identification guide or sheets that we put out as printable resources, you might see some yellow that remains from the main part of the body, uh, a couple of white wing bars, those are the white wing stripes on that wing, and in that overall black wing color. And if you're playing the matchy-matchy game right now, uh, you might recognize that as the American goldfinch. So that's the wing of an American goldfinch. Amazing. So we're gonna put another another wing out for you to see here. And uh, if you have an idea uh, about what this bird is, please put it in the chat. We wanna uh, get you thinking here. Um, so Levi's gonna show us the next bird. Uh, this one here, maybe I will. I can give the explanation of how it came to be uh, because I, I actually picked this one up. I was leaving work uh, last year, and the car in front of me hit this bird as it was flying across the road and I stopped and pulled over. This is one of the, I would say, flashier or brighter uh, birds that we have in Ontario, certainly dear to my heart. You can see that blue color, which I guess is called indigo because this is called an indigo bunting. Uh, if you have the opportunity and you're looking different types of birds up, indigo bunting certainly one that you want to check out, but that is an absolutely striking bird, uh, a beautiful, beautiful bird, the indigo bunting typically nests uh, in open parts of forests, uh, right on the edges of forests and fields, um, where, where those habitats meet. Amazing. All right, Levi, show us our last wing here. Uh, this is one that students might be familiar with uh, from the distinctive color. Put your guesses in the chat. Levi, do you want to tell us anything about, uh, about this particular specimen? Yeah, so uh, this bird uh, also died at Wrigley Corners. Uh, Wrigley Corners is going to sound like a bad place for birds, unfortunately. <laughs> well, um, you spend a lot of time there, so... Uh, so. But, yeah, we ended up uh, having this one hit one of our windows as well, and uh, we collected it, and uh, we act the original intent was to have it taxidermied and to have it as a specimen in the center. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the freezer, which is where we store them until we can take them to the taxidermist, uh, it got a little bit freezer burned, and uh, it ruined the, the main body of the specimen, so uh, we collected the, the wings so that we could use them for demonstrations. So that's sadly where this one came from. Uh, if you are uh, l using the key that Al mentioned earlier, this is one of the birds that you can find in Waterloo in the winter. Uh, it's fairly unmistakable, because there are very few birds that have plumage like this. Uh, and I imagine if we were to look in the chat, I can't see it right now. I suspect there's gonna be lots of students guessing Northern Cardinal, and that is in fact what it is. Fantastic, thank you very much, Levi. Uh, what do you have over there? I have a larger wing. Uh, and Levi, when I said you spend lots of time at Wrigley Corners, I was referring to the fact that you're there all the time and able to find these birds uh, if they do meet their demise. Yes. Uh, this is uh, not on our identification sheet, but it is a bird that we sometimes find in Waterloo Region. Uh, this bird was unfortunately hit by a car and it was too badly damaged to be, to be stuffed by our taxidermist. So a taxidermist is a person that does the stuffing of the animals for us. And I had, because the entire animal, the entire bird could not be stuffed, I asked for a wing mount. And you might recognize this as a pretty big white bird with some brown black speckles on it. This is a snowy owl wing and snowy owls do come down to the northern end of Waterloo region uh, pretty well every year but you have to keep a keen eye open in order to see them. So it is a bird that's not on our list but that's not a wing this is a wing. <laughs> <laughs> All right fantastic Dave. Bring the camera over here we're going to turn it over to, to Joe again. Well, uh, that is a great uh, way to introduce uh, a fun activity we did. 
uh, I want all of uh, our staff and students that are viewing today to know that we actually reached out to our senior team. So these are the uh, these are the folks that help support our principals and all of our students across our system. And actually, this is quite interesting. We actually asked Mr. John Bryant, the director of education of our board, what is your favorite winter bird uh, species? And his response was the snowy owl. And uh, he chose the snowy owl because of uh, their eyesight and uh, because they can see at great distance and the remarkable hearing. Now we also included in that our associate director, Miss Lila Reed, and her choice was the chickadee. And we've had lots of chickadees visiting the palms of Al and Levi today, and they're buzzing around us, which is wonderful. And uh, Miss Reed uh, chose that because she sees the chickadee as a symbol of happiness, positivity, and good fortune. And one more of our senior leaders, Ron DeBoer, who actually uh, is my boss and works with me uh, to support this outdoor education team to bring these broadcasts to you. He chose, now I don't know if this is a winter bird, but we're gonna put it in here, but he loves the osprey. Now the osprey for him is a bird that is ever present and watchful. So thank you for the senior team for participating. And now I'm gonna take this, this leads into a great question. Um, uh, who can tell us, and this is from distance learning class 432, who can tell us what is considered the most Canadian bird? Do we have agreement across our panel, or is this going to cause perhaps a little bit of a flutter of feathers? Let's see. I well, I can take that question to start with. I'm going to take the obvious answer, which is the Canada Jay. There's a bit of a story there. Um, but you may have seen online, uh, when you went to log into our, uh, our live stream, there's a picture with the, the time and date for the live stream, and there's a gray bird with a head cocked to the side. That's the Canada Jay. We don't get them down here in Waterloo Region. They're a little bit farther north, but they are in every province and territory of Canada. Good answer. I had to steal it before anybody else could. Yeah, well, I mean, I, has it been made official that the Canada Jay is, in fact, when, uh, one of our experts you're, you're, is saying no, I'm one of our no, experts is saying yes. yes. Oh, I uh, it no. The provincial bird of Ontario is the loon. Um, there was a vote. I know they had a vote on which one they thought which bird should be the national bird of Canada. Not a lot of people were aware of Canada Jay. Not a lot of people knew about this bird. And so it didn't get a lot of votes, but for people who know about birds, you know, it is in every province, it is in every territory. That seems like a good choice. It's got a great personality. It's a friendly bird. It will eat out of your hand as well. And so I support the Canada Jay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a tough, tough one. Um, if, if not the Canada Jay, then the, the chickadee should definitely be on that list. Uh, you can also find the black-capped chickadee across Canada. Um, they're charismatic and friendly, uh, as evidenced by the fact that they're landing on our hands today. So I would either go for the black-capped chickadee, and if I was able to like, sneak in a second one, I might say the uh, white-throated sparrow would be another good candidate, because they actually sing, Oh, Canada, Canada, Canada. So I would go for that one, too. I'm going to sneak in, too. <laughs> I'm sneaking in too. Uh, I did vote for Canada's uh, the Canada's national bird. Uh, I I voted for a common raven. I think it uh, because it's found in every province and territory. That's an important aspect of it. But it's also important for the indigenous communities. Uh, if I could sneak in another one, I would say Harris's sparrow. It is the it is I think one of the only birds in Canada that its entire entire life and breeding range is is within Canada uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna slip that one in Harris's sparrow its entire breeding range is in Canada there are no breeding Harris's sparrows in any other country other than Canada what do we call that what's the science word for that oh <laughs> unique <laughs> go for it Levi <laughs> well I'm not sure if this fits the strictest definition of the term, but we would all we call that endemic. Oh, so yeah. the Harris Sparrow is endemic to Canada, and that makes it definitely a special one for, for us. Amazing. Well, <laughs> we are getting close to time here, but I know we got started a little bit late, so we might go a, a little bit over time. I want to sneak in two more questions. 
Uh, one of these questions is from Jawad of uh, grade six distance learning. Uh, and his question is, why do woodpeckers peck my house when there is no food in my house? <laughs> and uh, one other question for our team here from Josh at Janet Metcalf. How in the world do they fly? And why can't I fly just by moving my hands up and down? <laughs> oh man, uh, why do woodpeckers <laughs> peck your house even though it's not made of food? Uh, well, it depends on the time of year. Maybe, maybe there is some food in it you don't know about, but pro the more probable reason is it would be springtime and there's a certain part of your house that resonates sound very well. Uh, like, like the box of a guitar, if you're playing gu gu guitar, that sort of round part where the strings are is used to amplify the sound. And there might be a portion of your house that is when a woodpecker's drumming, trying to attract a mate, it wants that sound to travel as far as possible. It could be amplifying the sound of it drumming. So there could be something hollow or something that makes a really good sound when it drums to carry that sound further to carry it to a potential mate. Levi, how do birds fly and why can't people fly? <laughs> oh, I took the easy part, good. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, and birds can fly, you know, for a variety of reasons, but the, the feather structure that they have that uh, we don't have is really the functional piece. That's the thing that lets them fly. The, uh, the, the feathers are very, very light. Uh, and they're, if you were to look at a feather under a microscope, uh, it's, it's a long shaft with tiny little hairs sticking out of it that have little tiny barbs and they mesh together and they, they hold on to each other. So even though they're very, very thin, very, very light, they're able to push because they're stuck together. They're able to push very effectively against the air when they, they move their wings backwards. Uh, and uh, that, the fact that they have those very specialized structures called feathers, uh, is the key to bird flight. However, birds have other, a couple other really important adaptations that allow them to, that allow them to do this. Uh, one of which is that they have hollow bones. Many of the bones in a bird's body are, uh, they have a, like, like a fine honeycomb structure on the inside, uh, filled with air or a light, yeah, with air. And that allows them to have an overall lower body weight for the size of the bird. And then they also have sacs under their skin, in their body. There's six of them that run through their body that when they breathe in, they can fill up sort of the same way you fill up your lungs. And that gives them some uh, added buoyancy when they're flying. So there's three really important adaptations that birds have that allow them to fly that we don't. Good answer. Now I thought while we were here, I would show uh, just as something fun, we decided to keep a bird list of all the birds we saw or heard just while we were doing uh, our live event here. And certainly we've seen the chickadees. We've seen a couple jays uh, right at the start before we uh, pushed record. We uh, had a cooper's hawk fly over. We've got a few f flocks of pine siskins that have gone by. Uh, I saw a wild turkey coming in today. We had a red-tailed hawk at the gate of the nature center. Uh, probably maybe the one that I got most excited about was this pileated woodpecker that it's the largest woodpecker in North America, size of a crow that went by. We didn't get a great look at it, but it was here. Uh, we saw some crows and we heard a downy woodpecker uh, just behind us here. And, you know, part of this list here, it's a good example of how if you just go outside and you stand someplace and you be in the moment and you allow yourself to relax a little bit and you listen, uh, you can come up with a pretty good bird list anywhere. You could get you could get nine or ten birds standing on the sidewalk in your neighborhood uh, for an hour. So um, if you're participating in the bird count, sometimes it's not so much a matter of going to a whole bunch of different places to find birds as just being in one spot and being aware of them uh, while you're there. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sean. Now, uh, I know some of you might be wondering, are we going to hear Sean sing Birds are everywhere, man. And the answer is yes, that's going to be our last thing. Uh, but before we get to that, um, there are some, some kind of special opportunities this year in particular. So we have one question for our experts, which is, what birds might we be able to see this winter that we might not normally see in Waterloo Region? All right, fantastic question. Uh, this is a special year for winter birds in Waterloo. Uh, there has, there's an eruption, uh, which is, uh, when a bird that normally isn't found in Waterloo, usually much farther north, uh, has a reason to fly further south. And uh, the, the bird that has erupted into Waterloo this year is the evening grosbeak. 
this is a, a large bird, so it's the size of a cardinal, only uh, it has that same big wedge-shaped beak that a cardinal does, only instead of being red, they're yellow, black, and white. Uh, but they're pretty big, they're, again, unmistakable, just like that cardinal, only yellow instead of red. Uh, if, if you go out for a walk, you might see them uh, perched in a, a tree that has green needles on it still, so a, a conifer. Um, but they also have been coming to people's bird feeders. So if you have a bird feeder set up in your yard, uh, keep an eye peeled for a bird that's bright yellow. If it's larger than a chickadee, if it's approaching the size of a cardinal, uh, take a really good look, maybe even take a photo, because uh, there's a good chance that that's an evening roast beak. And if I, if I can just add to that, yeah. um, there's evening grosbeak, beak, uh, common red pole is another one, which is another finch that has come down. And the reason they come down is because the food that they eat or try to find in their, in their regular range, uh, where they would normally be found, it just doesn't exist. Uh, bushes and trees pr produce seeds in cycles. So sometimes you have trees and bushes that make lots of seeds. Sometimes you have bushes and trees that make very few. And this happens to be a year where the trees and bushes have made very few seeds. And if you're able to move, and birds obviously are capable of flight, many of them, uh, you go somewhere else to find your food. And in this case, they've chosen to come down to the Southern Ontario part where the trees and bushes in this area actually did produce seed. So some are going to make their way further south into the US, but we're gonna have a lot of them stopping in the Waterloo region and, and Southern Ontario. So as Levi said, keep your eyes open. These are very unique birds. This only happens about one every uh, eight to 10 years or so that we have these birds in Southern Ontario. We should maybe point out one other thing about the gross bees. Sure. Sorry, <laughs> we can make this go for a long time. Uh, the other really important thing everybody should note about even gross beaks is that they have the ignoble honor of being the bird that has had the fastest declining population uh, in all of North America. Nine out of 10 evening gross beaks have disappeared since 1970. So that it's a 92% decline. Uh, no other bird in North America has disappeared as quickly as the evening gross beak. Why are they disappearing? Yeah, that's a great question, Sean. Uh, a big part of that is habitat loss. So evening gross beaks uh, breed in the boreal forest and the, the boreal forest is huge, but we have significantly altered large portions of it uh, through forestry, but also uh, other uh, it, it, energy intense, or sorry, other resource extraction activities like um, looking for natural gas and oil. Amazing, we're gonna take, uh, take one moment here to go to Joe for one last question from the chat. We have one final question and it's a question that's gonna bring a lot of joy to every one of our outdoor uh, education and environmental specialists. And that is, uh, it's coming from Anna from Miss Kunkel's class. And she is asking, uh, have you ever taken any pictures of or filmed birds? Take it away. <laughs> well, uh, yes. Uh, you know, I take pictures of the birds at the feeder outside my window. I got a pretty good camera for Christmas a couple of years ago and I'm trying to figure that out to figure out the zoom. I'm going to tell you that most bird pictures are terrible and you should not feel bad that when you see a bird outside and you point your cell phone at it and you push, you know, uh, the red button that you're going to get a good picture because it is hard to get a good picture of birds um, and even, even people are out there spending hours who are serious about it and who have the really good equipment it's tough to get good pictures of birds and so you know that's a part of bird watching you can get into but not necessary if i had to say so i'll keep my answer really really brief because of uh our department's journey into trying to do live events and you know teaching virtually uh, i've ended up playing a lot with audio visual equipment uh, i am not an accomplished accomplished photographer uh, but I have become fascinated with bird sound. And so we've been playing with microphones and things like that. And I think I'm going to make a new hobby of going out and collecting bird sounds instead. So that's going to be my new thing. Hi, Anna. Good to see you again. Spent time with your class yesterday. Uh, I do like taking photos of birds. Um, it's something, photography as a hobby is something I've done for years. Uh, I don't specialize in birds because they are very, very difficult to get good photos, as Sean said. but. They're certainly on the list of uh, species or types of living things that I do like to photograph. So I like birds, I like taking pictures of them, but it's not the only thing I picture or take photos of. 
All right, well, I know that we've gone over time here, so before we turn it over to Sean for our closing song, just want to remind you that the winter bird count is coming up. We need everybody to participate. The data that is collected during the winter bird count, we'll be able to use it as a department. We're also going to send it on uh, to some larger organizations uh, that have kind of an international reach, uh, Project Feeder Watch and, uh, and the Christmas bird count. Uh, which have been collecting data for a long time so um, those students who are collecting data know that that data is going to be used to help track migration and bird populations by real scientists who get paid to study and conserve birds so once again the dates for the bird count are december 16th to 23rd i encourage students and teachers to practice uh, identifying birds or attracting birds outside your window uh, between now and then so that you can can get some practice uh, and once again thank you to everybody who's tuned in to watch uh, we're really happy to be uh, uh, sharing with you our, our knowledge and, and uh, you know, experience and passion for birds. Um, so thanks for watching and uh, without further ado, let's take it to, to Sean McCammon here. All right, thank you very much. Well, uh, I do play guitar and at the Nature Center, I like to maybe write a couple songs that go with each of my programs just as a fun thing. And so I did have a bird song that maybe you saw in the video promoting this event today. And so, uh, Mr. Singh's class yesterday was asking me, uh, are you gonna sing your song? And yes, I am, so. I, I mentioned about 70 different types of birds in this song. It's hard, this is a hard one to remember all the words to, but here we go. Well, I had my binoculars just walking down the streets, staring into the trees where I thought I heard her tweets. There was a man on his porch wearing a big straw hat. He said, hey there now, mister, what you staring at? I said, not to worry, man, I'm just a nature nerd. I ain't spying on your house. I'm just looking at the birds. Birds are everywhere, man. Birds are everywhere, man. Don't be such a square, man. Get up off your chair, man. Breathe out for a stare, man. Birds are everywhere.